Section twenty seven of The Rookeries of London by Thomas Beams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Yearsley. Section twenty seven. Mayhap you'll say we are exceeding the bounds we had assigned to our lucubrations, that we are concerned with one form of evil, when popular outbreaks are the offsprings of accumulated injuries. Still, rookeries are seldom tolerated where other evils have been long banished. You say that England had long ago, by wise reforms, anticipated the changes brought about by bloodshed in France, that we are far in advance of any country in Europe, our institutions more liberal, our government more sensitive to the popular wants, the voice of the people more audible than in any other corner of the world. We are not inclined to contest this, inasmuch as the question itself demands a close investigation, and one so elaborate that we are unequal to it. Still it is forgotten that laws have not taken cognizance of many offences against the welfare of the mass, yet that these very offences may have eaten deep into the hearts of the sufferers. A nation may be governed by an oligarchy, though the formal government be republican, and revolutions break out under a system of institutions whose very motto is freedom, for these very institutions may retain a place in the statute book when they have long been practically ignored. The changing circumstances of the age may make them of non-effect, and several classes unwittingly combine to keep them in the background. No great political change took place between the Revolution of 1688 and the Reform Bill. Still, you would not say that the exercise of the political franchise was equally effective during the reigns of the different sovereigns who held the sceptre in that interval, or that the popular voice was heard with the same distinctness in the reigns of William of Orange and George the Third. Our argument, rather, is that rookeries are among the seeds of revolutions, that taken in connection with other evils they poison the minds of the working classes against the powers that be, and thus lead to convulsions, and seldom, we repeat it, are such evils found alone. The spirit of justice, which regarded the claims of labour in other respects, would scarce doom the working man to crowded dwellings and a forfeiture of the commonest blessings God has given to man nor are recent events wanting in the same conclusions. From the days of the Gracchi till now, the working classes have been turbulent in proportion to their wants. In some cases they have originated commotions, for it seldom happens that leaders, demagogues, are wanting. Certain disappointed candidates for forensic or legislative honours, authors, men whose imagination is stronger than their judgment, men troubled with an unhappy, more than Irish, fluency of speech, persons whose ill success in the occupation which they originally took up has disgusted them, and who suppose they have a destiny to fulfil, needy men, envious men, vain, ambitious men, men weary of toil with an unhealthy distaste for business or routine, are never wanting. Not seldom the leaders are men fired with a nobler enthusiasm, whom success enrolls in the list of patriots, men scandalized by the real injuries which the working class endures, men eager for the renovation of their species, optimists, if you will, yet optimists from sympathy. Thus, when civil commotions stir the state, these tools are ready at hand. A burst of discontent is confirmed into a radical revolution. The movement loses its first vagueness, has a character, a name, an end, aims at a special reform, the removal of a special grievance, and the words liberty, equality, and fraternity have their utterance in national wages and national workshops. We are but just emerging from an European revolution. It may be questioned whether we have emerged. The agents of change may be recruiting their forces, preparing for some future and better conceived campaign. The revolutions took us by surprise. There were but few harbingers of their coming. All seemed profound peace. There had been no fierce battling for popular rights, no smothered discontent agitating large masses of the people. The cry of anarchy was not a novel thing. Men hoping much from it, as from some new and untried medicine, 
so that demagogues peopled the new era they anticipated with figures which their imagination conjured up. The continental commotions did not follow upon the heels of transatlantic emancipation, nor did Louis-Philippe pay the penalty of feeding disturbances in the colonies of a friendly state. Of a sudden, a cry for reform was heard, a cry artfully evoked by a party, which drew with it, as such cries ever do, a certain amount of sympathy. An attempt was made to stifle that cry, and behold, a revolution, a revolution extemporized, a revolution accomplished not so much in accordance with, but in spite of, the wishes of those who had agitated for reform, a revolution which took its agents by surprise, which achieved more than they devised, attempted, or desired, a revolution just as when children in their sport kindle the tiny flame which, increasing in spite of themselves, involves a household in ruin, a revolution carried out in spite of, yet not by the defeat of, the army, which had no definite object, which satisfied no one, which all would recall, which has yielded no fruits, which has checked, rather than aided, the cause of French and European reform, which has entailed at least as despotic, though a stronger, government upon the people. Yet no sooner was this revolution acknowledged than the claims of the mass, hitherto too much lost sight of, were recognized. Had we not witnessed the previous commotion, we should have supposed that a vast social change had taken place. Among the names of those to whom the government was entrusted figured conspicuously that of Albert Ouvrier, note, workman, end note, Albert Workman. What did he there? What business had he there at such a time? It was felt that if the revolution succeeded, it must succeed by redress that despite the political titles in which the change was veiled, at the bottom it was a social one. Workmen had aided in overturning the government. Whether that can be called a victory which won no trophies from conquered troops, whether that can be called a victory where rival combatants did not sustain, as they best might, their respective parts in the arena of the battlefield, may be well doubted but the mass had triumphed when the reform party were indecisive, the government supine. Saint Antoine had sent her hordes, those hordes had shed blood, and been themselves attacked, not on a grand scale, not that they disputed their positions inch by inch, yet the blood shed was theirs or that of their opponents. They were the force on which insurrection relied, and by which it prevailed and they must have their reward. Behold, then, the type of their class, the representative of their claims, Albert Ouvrier. The title took men by surprise. A new political banner was unfolded. On it were written the demands of the working classes. Rookeries, the claims of labour, the abolition of privileges, were the real elements of liberty, equality, fraternity. If you doubt this, ask what were among the first institutions, national workshops, national employers, national wages. We are not concerned in the failure of these chimerical attempts. They were, at least, the straws thrown up into the air. They showed which way the wind blew. Lamartine, speaking of an influential class among the labouring population of Paris, says, Quote, there exists a mass of workmen, artists, and artisans, belonging to those employments in which the hand and the mind are most closely connected, printers, engravers, mechanicians, cabinet-makers, locksmiths, carpenters, and others, forming together a mass of about fifty thousand. They have among themselves, in their respective trades, their societies, unions, organizations for mutual assistance, orators, delegates, who obtain a hold upon their confidence, and who discuss their interests with the contractors. Footnote. The historical student should read this book, because written by one who, as much to his own surprise as that of Europe, found himself the director of a revolution. Not that the book is remarkable for profound views, 
that it attempts an inquiry into the real causes of the revolution its narratives are worked up too much with a view to dramatic effect incidents are pregnant only with lamartine a crisis takes place at every section of the work there is a deus intersit that deus is lamartine the people murmur who quells them lamartine a thousand sabres glitter in the air who sheathes them lamartine they want a leader behold lamartine the fate of france depends upon an orator listen to lamartine the cry is for a statesman nature is bountiful and creates lamartine a certain verse writer of this day terms a new poem which he is engaged in a series of mental tableaux lamartine's work is a series of dramatic tableaux a second henriade as though the several wants of the age cried out and a good spirit gave them lamartine yet certain facts are elicited from which the student may form valuable conclusions End footnote. it was among these men that the different socialist schools which had sprung up since 1830 at Paris, Lyon, Rouen, and in Germany, recruited the greatest number of their followers. The problem, up to this period without radical solution, of the inequality of human situations, extreme misery by the side of extreme wealth, scandalized them, as it has scandalized, without effect, all the philosophers and religious men of all ages, they flattered themselves at having found a solution, some by imitation with Fourier of the monastic system, others by the brutal Indian system of castes with Saint-Simon, others by the religious united possession of land with Pierre Leroux, others by the suppression of the sign of riches in specie with Proudhon, the great proportion revolting at the impossibility, violence, and chimerical projects of these schools had imagined they had found a practical adjustment in the system at first sight less unreasonable and in appearance less subversive of louis blanc End quote. here then we have the organization of labor as the remedy proposed for bad lodgings scanty food intermittent wages and the claims of toil we are not concerned with the provisions or the fruits of this notable scheme but rather with the causes which led for a while to its adoption we are not disciples of this eccentric reformer, nor do we think it necessary to go to Utopia to find a salve for the wounds of our countrymen. Practical men were either beguiled, overruled, or frightened into this scheme. Was it that despair made them the victims of strange fancies, so that any hot-brained enthusiast had but to create a monster, and the people worshipped it as a god? or was it that their wrongs had made them mad men must have been hard driven by poverty to be thus beguiled and we find accordingly that louis blanc the author of the system tells us that he proposed this organization of labor as the remedy for social ills he speaks of the earnings of the laboring classes and very much does he dwell on the lodgings of the workmen on the french rookeries the hotbeds of insurrection and well he might when louis philippe surrounded himself with troops previous to the insurrection he took especial care to guard saint antoine the saint giles's of paris the artillery of vincennes the tower of that metropolis had orders to present itself at the first summons at the faubourg saint antoine as though the rookery quarter of paris was the focus of insurrection louis blanc's book is seldom read now its plans have failed it is only wonderful that they should ever have had a trial yet it is valuable as showing the social condition of the labourer at that time very valuable to us because it gives an account of the condition of the dwellings it describes the rookeries where the working classes lived the following is a quotation from dr guepin quote, if you would know how the artisan lodges enter one of the streets where he dwells in crowded poverty like the jews of the middle ages owing to the popular prejudices in the quarters set apart for them enter with stooping head into one of those alleys opening from the street and situated below its level 
the atmosphere there is cold and damp as in a cellar the feet slip upon the dirty soil and you dread falling down amid the filth on each side of the alley and below its level there is a room sombre large and cold whose walls drip with damp dirty water and which receives air from a miserable window too small to admit the light and too badly made to exclude the wind open the door and enter if the fetid air does not cause you to recoil but take care for the uneven floor is neither paved nor boarded or if so is covered with such a thickness of dirt that it is impossible to distinguish whether it is or not here are two or three beds repaired with rotten string they are mouldy and broken down a mattress a coverlet of ragged patchwork rarely washed because it is the only one sometimes sheets and a pillow behind the interior of the bed as for drawers and chests they have no need of them in these houses often a spinning wheel and a weaver's frame complete the furniture on the other stories the rooms though drier and better lighted are equally dirty and wretched there it is often without fire in the winter that by the light of a candle of resin men work fourteen hours a day for a salary of fifty to twenty sous the children of this class up to the moment that by a painful and brutalizing toil they can increase by a few farthings the incomes of their families pass their life in the mud of the gutters pale blotched and bruised their eyes red and sunken or injured by scrofulous ophthalmia they are painful to behold one would imagine them of another nature than the children of the rich between the men of the suburbs and those of the wealthier quarters the difference is not so great but there has been a terrible purification the strongest fruits have ripened but many have fallen from the tree after twenty years of age they are vigorous or dead End quote. again we are told quote, the number of lodging-houses of the lowest grade amounted in eighteen thirty six to two hundred and forty three and that they altogether contained a population of six thousand lodgers of which one third were women living by prostitution or robbery End quote. france then many will say is in the same condition as ourselves there is at times the same glut of work the same minimum of wages the same social discomforts bad lodgings scanty furniture insufficient food want of ventilation but then the expenses of the french working man are not so great as ours or his lodgings so dear thus again louis blanc tells us quote, whatever we could add on this subject the detail of the expenditure of this portion of society will speak more effectually note the figure quoted is of franc annually End note. rent for a family twenty five washing twelve fuel thirty five repair of furniture three moving at least once a year two shoes twelve clothes they wear old clothes which are given them note not stated End note surgeon gratis chemist gratis end of section 27section 28 of the rookeries of london by thomas beams this librivox recording is in the public domain read by peter yearsley section 28 a revolution breaks out for which it is difficult to find a sufficient cause the king was unpopular yet not so much as he had been french society was rotten at the heart but the agitation for reform did not seek to remedy its defects it was merely got up to extend the elective franchise full soon did the crying evils of the day claim to be heard reform was forgotten bread wages work the rights of labour the overthrow of the tyranny of capital were the watchwords of the insurgents the rookery districts poured forth their thousands st antoine rallied the combatants supplied the flames with fuels st antoine the stronghold the citadel the centre of the reaction 
Thence did the men who wished to rise upon the downfall of a monarchical government borrow their emissaries. Thence did demagogues call spirits from the vasty deep, and they did come when these did call. What had they to lose? What had they at stake? Success was justice, liberty, plenty, riches perhaps in prospect. The reformers, for a time, had their wish, more than their wish. Louis Philippe was overthrown, but did they retain the power they had snatched from him? For a time the flames they had kindled were smothered, not quelled. Yet for how short a time! Visionary schemes could not feed the bankrupt and the starveling. A philosophy which set facts and experience at defiance was too refined for hunger and sedition. Again they rose, to be again soothed into patience. Yet a little while, and they came again, maddened by previous disappointment, resolved not this time to be cheated of their rights, wilder still their theories. Communism, a hateful name, but one purse, but one storehouse for the nation's wants and the nation's expenditure, was the rallying cry of their hosts. Frantic with a government which had only played with their wrongs, maddened by hope deferred, they burst forth as a torrent for the destruction of all that opposed, and, after the issue had long been doubtful, were put down by the practised soldiery of France, yet not without much bloodshed, havoc, and ruin. Yet where did the battle rage the fiercest? Where do houses riddled by balls appall the stranger? In the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, in the neighbourhood of the Pantheon, and the Jardin des Plantes, where rookeries abound. The native atmosphere of the refuse of the people, the nursery of wretchedness, despair, and crime, where men are sheltered who have else no shelter, where common iniquities bring men together for the common defence. Each rookery district, and there are several in a city like Paris, was the scene of a separate combat. How desperately the denizens of those retreats struggled, the number of officers and soldiers slain bears fearful witness. After a conflict of four days, unparalleled for its savage ferocity, the anarchists were vanquished, but at a fearful cost, three or four thousand killed, and double that number wounded, is the very lowest estimate of the loss. At this time, one hundred and twenty thousand workmen were receiving state wages, and nearly ten thousand are supposed to have been killed, wounded, and taken prisoners. The flame which first broke out in France quickly extended through Europe, Berlin, Vienna, Munich, Naples, Rome, Frankfurt, Madrid, were the scenes of fierce outbreaks. In most of these capitals the people obtained some triumphs before they were ultimately quelled. Still the working classes were for the most part the combatants, though the labour question did not assume so prominent a place in the agitation elsewhere as in France. England escaped, not without a strong demonstration of physical force on the part of the government, yet who were they whom the vast array of the 10th of April were in arms to resist? Were they not the inhabitants of our rookeries? Did not each poor quarter of the town pour forth its multitudes to swell the great gatherings on Kennington Common, and, as the cellars in Berlin had been the debating rooms of the insurgents, so the rookeries of London were the nuclei of the disaffected. And when an army was sent to Ireland, against whom was the array set in order? Against the tenants of mud huts and Irish cabins, against the remnants of Skibbereen, those whom fever had spared, who had not been among the victims whom famine had doomed. As if rookeries, whether in the courts of St. Giles, or in the plains of Tipperary, were not the types of social disease, the abodes of those who were the victims of the plague. We gather then from the survey we have just made that disturbances and outbreaks spring from social privations and neglect. The history of Europe furnishes too many parallels. Arbitrary laws have held captive mind and body, till, as the mind expanded, it burst the bonds, and men achieved reforms by violence, 
which wisdom and foresight should have long ago conceded the poor were neglected till they pleaded their own cause with arms in their hands or laid down their own terms as masters whom strength and success allowed to dictate or when forcibly repressed in their very defeat inspired wholesome terror lest the returning wave stronger than that which preceded it should make a further inroad and engulf what had been hitherto preserved so that men in power have given way to reforms not because prejudiced in their favour but rather from a conviction that it was wise to yield what they could hold no longer so that these very reforms have not been so much the redress of political as social grievances and the rights of labour recognised in proportion as the licence of luxury was abridged strong as we are secure as we have been we may yet bear to listen to the teaching of history its lessons are for us for us round whom the middle class reared an impregnable rampart and who have lived through convulsions which shook to the centre the great powers of europe that splendid monument of wisdom and courage the english constitution may defy minor attacks afford to despise them other nations are only now winning the privileges we enjoy are only opening their eyes slowly to the light which has long been our birthright yet with all this if we forbear to renovate where time has ravaged to remedy abuses which none can palliate the day of retribution must come our children may possess an heritage blasted by our neglect and the swords their fathers have sharpened pierce them to the heart we cannot defy history we cannot be so secure as that the same causes shall not again produce the same effects our boasted middle class envies already too much the privileges of the aristocracy our aristocracy feels too much their loss of influence in the national councils the advocates of free trade elicit cheers in one county in another and that an adjoining one the champion of agriculture is hailed with applause surely then there are elements of strife and though opposite combinations greater than these have been dissolved without injury to the nation there are yet grounds of apprehension should either appeal to popular support let us then be up and be doing our task it is to describe only one social evil although that a monster and the parent of a host of ills sufficient for us is it to have denounced that we have seen and known and which has been a source of almost daily disquiet grant if you will that such an anomaly may exist and yet england be the home of a peace as profound as that under which we now repose calculate if you will how many years the strong walls of england's citadel may withstand a storm believe it and there is much to cherish the idea that our sons and our sons sons may escape the desolation which has laid waste foreign cities if only they progress in the same course of temperate reform as their forefathers tell us that every large city must have its background of wretchedness and still we cannot believe that our countrymen kind liberal generous wishing that others should participate in the blessings they enjoy will sit down quietly with the consciousness that such evils are unchecked grant that the evil day be staved off the sore will yet fester and english life be poisoned by a wound so deep so rankling grant that among us insurrection is a hopeless thing vaunt if you will with some pride the social and political blessings which exalt the working man in england above his compeers in other lands yet recollect the spirit which won those blessings is still alive in the breasts of englishmen and they who suffer must suffer in sullen silence and brooding discontent the feudal institutions much as they degenerated were conceived upon the idea and in the spirit of brotherhood 
union for mutual interest and defence the lord might call his vassal to the war but then he protected him in peace he wrung hard service from him but deemed as his own the affront offered to his dependent in the same hall with himself that dependent fed he was nourished and sustained by his lord the property of the baron himself depended much on the fidelity of his retainers it was his interest to protect one so closely united to himself true feudal government at length degenerated into an oppression yet this its early practice knew not and it was foreign to the theory which gave it birth many bodies corporate there are now though no corporate title distinguish them our large manufacturers our foundries and so on what are they but commercial leagues in which masses are associated together obeying one mind and working out the designs of one employer not seldom a thousand hands in a single establishment you may answer that the numbers engaged in such schemes are too fluctuating to allow of a comparison with our ancient institutions even if other circumstances permitted it yet fluctuate as they will these operatives follow but one trade if dismissed by one employer they must get work from another in the same branch of commerce and there is a numerical standard below which those employed never fall many are constantly employed for years under the same manufacturer and are to all intents and purposes his dependents yet where is the recognition of brotherhood here is there the slightest connection other than that of work and wages between them does the employer know even by name the men who have been constantly for years employed in his factory has he the most distant idea how they are lodged fed or tended in sickness suppose the employer a man of active benevolence and you might expect that a little colony would rise in the neighbourhood either of his factory or the town in which it was situated this colony tenanted by his operatives superintended by himself the place where he gave his little senate laws many such colonies there were in feudal times why not now is it that the law has made men less dependent upon the strong arm of their lord and patron or is it that individual avarice denies the funds individual indolence shrinks from the experiment we have termed our rookeries plague spots are they not indeed such where are our convicts nursed the men whom our distant colonies reject for whom there is our vast array of penitentiaries prison ships hulks penal settlements and the like these men ply a daily trade in our large towns their occupation regulated by laws peculiar to themselves their very thefts determined by the nicest and most rigid calculation these men exist in bodies there are particular sections of crime particular gathering places and bodies corporate do not such outcasts hide their heads in rookeries because the very wretchedness of these districts acts as a charm is their shield disgusts men so that they shun them avoid them as though they were the nurseries of disease and in close connection with such dregs of society does the honest and the hard-working labourer rest his weary head his children playing with felons children learning their habits infected by their example and as a man sinks in the world here is the receptacle for him his heart broken he retreats to scenes like these to learn by contrast the height from which he has fallen you have as you are bound to have your remedial schemes schools cramped and crippled as they are by party feuds which impart religious and secular knowledge to the children of the poor yet is not the edge of teaching blunted by the habits these rookeries oppose to it you teach precepts not merely conducing to the present profit but rather elevating and ennobling the child's nature what an atmosphere is that of rookeries to mature them dwellings which barely supply the most elementary wants of our being the scenes where children shall put to proof what they learn where the good the generous and the noble within 
is cramped by the narrowness of all around still we may not despair while our pen traces these concluding pages an appeal for the needle women of england has been answered as englishmen should answer the cry of distress and large already is the contribution which their advocate has obtained from his countrymen footnote an appeal for the needle women of england emigration is preached up at present as our great national safety valve and this is to be the resource of distressed needlewomen it is assumed that the country cannot support its present population and new zealand the most fertile colony we possess and the finest climate we have yet discovered is to be the basis of the rising generation on the other hand the chartist committees are telling the people that there is sufficient land if properly cultivated to maintain a hundred and fifty millions of people what shall we say to statements so different has the last assertion even a show of truth in its favour emigration no doubt has much in its favour the colonies want we are glutted with labour the strength of the colonies hereafter must be not english armies but a native population and to retain at least the english name and language among them we must feed them more with english labourers and artisans europe we are told is worn out if it be so we are wise before the house tumbles to look out for the best situation in which to build a new one but suppose we take a less gloomy and truer view of the case the colonies are likely to be more profitable and not so expensive as workhouses and there seems no reason why we should not but rather every encouragement to urge us to apply a portion of the rates to promote emigration in our workhouses it is well known a man soon loses self-respect independence of action is necessarily checked and the man soon degenerates despite the increased care taken to improve the inmates workhouses are schools of vice the old women are often known to corrupt the young and it is scarce likely that youths will learn prudence and self-control from those many of whom are doomed for life to inhabit the workhouse from want of both with much we could wish otherwise we may still be very proud of our offspring the united states in the struggles of future ages they will rub off much of the rust which still adheres to them and the present is full of hope with respect to the assumption of land societies it seems scarcely possible under the most favourable circumstances that the country should feed even its present amount of population agricultural science like every other science is progressive men cannot anticipate some agricultural newton may arise and treble the produce of our national granary but as yet there are no signs of his coming the population is likely to run faster than the progress of science for science here wants capital and there is a tendency to withdraw capital from agriculture to lay down cornland to grass to make large farms farms in fact too large for any but a man of property to undertake and then this landlord farmer will not superintend minutely every portion of his farm that he may avoid this he will like to have pasture instead of arable lands for they are less troublesome so that the country if it ever became wedded to such a system would produce less rather than more than it does at present still there is a shadow of truth in the assertion of these land societies some thousand acres in england are uncultivated not the commons in the neighbourhood of towns which ought ever to be preserved for the people's relaxation not the pasture meadows where rich and poor have the privilege of turning their cattle out during great part of the year but large tracts of land such as in derbyshire seem only valuable as grouse preserves such as in scotland are parcelled out in deer forests and the like when the population is so superabundant these things should not be it savours too much of feudal times and in the neighbourhood of these hunting grounds game laws are rigidly enforced not trespass laws which very properly would prevent men from breaking down fences and making paths where there are none 
but laws which fine men because they kill the hare which runs across their garden or shoot the stray pheasant which has broken bounds i do not mean to say that under a better system we should fulfil the prophecies or disarm the rancour of the chartist school yet to the right-thinking man it is some satisfaction that he has removed just cause of offence and that if called on to defend his privileges they are not such as he would blush to own in the pamphlet to which we have alluded are some sad details take the following quote, i stitch says one woman the legs of trousers when there are any but for these five weeks i haven't earned more than one shilling and fourpence for the party who gives them to me hasn't had any work himself to do he gives me a penny a pair and finds me the thread four pair is as much as i can do in the day from six in the morning to six at night i can't see by candlelight it would not pay me to have a candle for such work the most i ever earned was two shillings the week and that my girl helps me to a good bit twenty-four pair is more than one hand can do that's more than twelve months ago since i did as much as that about one shilling a week some weeks and some weeks ninepence and some weeks sixpence and this week it will be threepence End quote. another states quote, it is not a farthing more than three shillings a week that i earn take it all the year round and out of that there's thread candle and firing to be taken away and that comes to one shilling a week for coal candle and wood and sixpence for thread leaving about one shilling and sixpence for my clear earnings after working the whole week through but that's better than nothing my husband has lately been in the hospital End quote. End footnote. oh that one with eloquence would plead the cause we have so feebly set forth that one earnest for his poorer brethren known and honoured in his generation would arise to urge the claims of labour on those who direct it and on those who are benefited by its results circumstances are related tales told of the sufferings of these needlewomen which make the blood run cold the needlewomen who people our rookeries whom drury lane saffron hill wapping and shoreditch shelter if the term be not a mockery mothers toiling by day and night to earn three shillings and sixpence a week for the support of their family and part of that too spent in the materials needed for the work and then eking out the rest of their miserable pittance how by involuntary prostitution and these prostitutes too not merely the unmarried but married women their husbands consenting because poverty was killing their children these wretched victims of mammon putting on the unwilling blandishment made tempters in spite of themselves lest their offspring should starve is not the very name of christianity we might ask forgotten in a land which tolerates such a curse are their shopkeepers banded together to sell articles spotted with the poison of that which is more precious than the life-blood of their fellow-creatures and purchasers economizing on the infamy of their countrywomen men daring to take the bible in their hands who dole out under pretence of pay the wretched pittance in return for the days of toil and nights of agony not that the purchasers know the source whence comes the cheapness so precious in their eyes that the thoughtless many pause to think that they deck themselves willingly with the spoils of their country's disgrace but some there must be many who know at what cost this accursed cheapness is achieved and into what a pit of infamy these thoughtless economists are plunging the mothers of our working classes no one who pretends to interest himself in the great question of the day may we not write of his country's infamy perhaps his country's ruin should be without the pamphlet entitled the needlewomen of england it has been before published in and is now extracted from the letter to the morning chronicle every mother should come forward from every class with her superfluities and her savings to check the unhallowed work which is polluting her countrywomen we read in roman history that when carthage was brought to the verge of ruin in the last punic war 
the Carthaginians brought their vessels of silver and gold, and gave them to the state, which needed them so much, and the women plaited their hair into bowstrings, lest the war should flag, and in our great rebellion many of the colleges of Oxford melted down their plate to support the royal cause. Is no effort to be made to save the mothers of England from prostitution? We may not despair. The strong old English spirit yet warms many a heart, and the strong old English energy still nerves many a hand among us. Europe is heaving with the swell of a revolution, a jacquerie, and yet a war of opinions too, as Canning predicted, and men have stirred the fire who felt they were not fed, clothed, paid, lodged as they ought to be. We have stood firm as a rock, still looking on with careful scrutiny, looking round with jealous vigilance, to detect the blemishes of our own fabric. Not from fear, so much as sense of duty, not from impulse, but inquiry, we have shaken off our apathy, and men are coming forward with new schemes, and aiding, by new grants, the distress to which their eyes at length are opened. What a time, then! to plead that rookeries may no longer be. What a time to speak to the better emotions of English hearts. England, our beloved country, the mother of freedom, the asylum of the persecuted, whose sons have gone forth from their island home to teach the British tongue and hand down the British name to empires, now just springing into life, who at the cost of twenty millions willed that slavery should be no more. Look around on what she has done, and think not that her strength is spent, or her arm unnerved. If rookeries be the canker worms, not of England, but of Europe, may she, who is the first in arts and arms, be the first to sweep them from the land they disgrace. May she take the lead in the holy work, from whom the voice has oft gone forth, which awoke Europe from her slumber. It shames us to plead with Christian men in arguments which expediency commends, or where profit must be the medium of conviction. We call them by that better, nobler, holier bond to remember that they are brethren, yes, brothers they are, whose sickness rookeries aggravate, whose weariness they mock, whose hearts they sear, brothers clinging with a fondness which poverty cannot shake to the country which gave them birth, brothers proud of the name that country has won, brothers still bending before the laws which govern them, still sending forth their sons to combat for England's fame and to bleed in her defence. Oh, that these our feeble hands might lay one stone of this vast reform, our eyes to be permitted to see some part of the good work done in this our age. We stand high, and we deserve it. We alone support a law for the relief of the poor. The theorist questions its utility. Nevertheless, the sneers of the selfish deter us not. The syllogisms of the political economist convince us not. Verily, we are obstinate to maintain a custom which our fathers valued and our brethren stand by. Let us do more in some degree remove the necessity of a state assistance by teaching the poor man to respect himself and to be proud of his own independence love of decency is still a home plant cherish it by dwellings large enough for its indulgence teach men to care for their minds by showing them you are not indifferent to their bodies bind them to you because you share with them the blessings you enjoy evoke their loyalty to their sovereign when the ruling powers have recognized their claims as subjects appeal to their consciences as christians by acknowledging first that they have the feelings of men education will be valued by those who have means to improve themselves religion thrive when it makes the rich alive to the wants of the poor a happier day will dawn rookeries be remembered not by what they are but as the dungeons of an ancient castle whose horrors tradition records custom has long superseded like monoliths and cromlechs relics of an elder age
End of section 28. Section 29 of The Rookeries of London by Thomas Beams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Yearsley. Postscript. Fire of London. Its ravages, its effect upon rookeries. We have frequently alluded to the fire of London and the effect it had upon the present condition of the metropolis. A long account of this great national calamity would have been out of place in the middle of this volume, but perhaps it may be welcome to some few at the end of the book. There is, in fact, a striking difference between the older parts of London and those of foreign cities, which is mainly owing to the fire. In other countries we are enabled to trace the different periods of domestic, ecclesiastical, or civic architecture by the buildings which survive in different parts of the metropolis. In London, the Hôtel de Ville, or Mansion House, is little more than one hundred years old. The city halls of the olden times must have been glorious buildings, if we may judge by Crosby Hall, and the dwelling-houses quaint structures, if the Hoban end of Staples Inn is a fair specimen. But the fire has been fatal to our curiosity in this respect, so that Bristol, York, and Chester still preserve more models of a bygone age than London itself. The Palace of Bridewell, the residence of Henry the Eighth, the remains of John of Gaunt's house, Old St. Paul's, which, however, Inigo Jones is supposed, in his ignorance of Gothic architecture, to have spoiled. The old custom house, on the site of that rebuilt by Charles the Second, were the victims of this dreadful catastrophe. Footnote: The Palace of Bridewell, the residence of Henry the Eighth. The kings of this realm says Stripe, have been there lodged, and their courts of law have been kept there of old time, and till the ninth of Henry the third, the courts were kept in the king's house, wheresoever he was lodged, as may appear by ancient records. King Henry the eighth builded there a stately and beautiful house of new, for receipt of the Emperor Charles V, who in the year 1522 was lodged himself at the Black Friars, but his nobles in this new builded bridewell, a gallery being made over the water and through the wall of the city into the emperor's lodging at the Black Friars. King Henry himself oftentimes lodged there also, as, namely, in the year 1525, a parliament being then holden in the Black Friars. It was converted to its present purpose as a house of correction in the reign of Edward the Sixth. The analyst speaks of a picture hanging near the pulpit in the chapel of Bridewell, with these lines on it, quote, This Edward of fair memory the sixth, in whom with greatness goodness was co-mixed, gave this Bridewell a palace in old times, for a chastising house of vagrant crimes. End quote. End footnote. The fire broke out on the 2nd of September, 1666, in the middle of the night, a high wind aided its fury. The following is the account given in the London Gazette. Quote, On the second instant, at one of the clock of the morning, there happened to break out a sad and deplorable fire in Pudding Lane, near New Fish Street, which, falling out at that hour of the night, and in a quarter of the town so closely built with wooden pitched houses, spread itself so far before day, and with such distraction to the inhabitants and neighbours, that care was not taken for the timely preventing of the farther diffusion of it by pulling down houses, as ought to have been, so that this lamentable fire in a short time became too big to be mastered by any engines working near it. It fell out most unhappily, too, that a violent easterly wind fomented it, and kept it burning all that day and night following spreading itself to Gracechurch Street and downwards, from Cannon Street to the water's side, as far as the three cranes in the Vintry, the people in all parts about it, distracted by the vastness of it, and their particular care to carry away their goods, many attempts were made to prevent the spreading of it by pulling down houses, and making great intervals, but all in vain, the fire seizing upon the timbers and rubbish, and so continuing itself even through these spaces, 
and raging in a bright flame all Monday and Tuesday, notwithstanding His Majesty's own and His Royal Highness's indefatigable and personal pains to apply all possible remedies to prevent it, calling upon and helping the people with their guards, and great number of nobility and gentry unweariedly assisting therein, for which they were requited with a thousand blessings from the poor distressed people. By the favour of God the wind slackened a little on Tuesday night, and the flames meeting with brick buildings at the temple, by little and little it was observed to lose its force on that side, so that on Wednesday morning we began to hope well, and His Royal Highness, never despairing or slackening his personal care, wrought so well that day, assisted in some parts by the Lords of the Council, before and behind it, that a stop was put to it at the Temple Church, near Hoban Bridge, Pie Corner, Aldersgate, Cripplegate, near the lower end of Bishopsgate Street and Leadenhall Street, at the Standard in Cornhill, at the Church in Fenchurch Street, near Clothworkers Hall, in Mincing Lane, at the middle of Mark Lane and at the Tower Dock. On Thursday, by the blessing of God, it was wholly beat down and extinguished, but so as that evening it unhappily burst out again afresh at the temple by the falling of some sparks, as is supposed, upon a pile of wooden buildings. But His Royal Highness, who watched there that whole night in person, by the great labour and diligence used, and especially by applying powder to blow up the houses about it, before day most happily mastered it. Diverse strangers, Dutch and French, were, during the fire, apprehended upon suspicion that they contributed mischievously to it, who are all imprisoned, and informations prepared to make a severe inquisition thereupon by my Lord Chief Justice Keeling, assisted by some of the Lords of the Privy Council, and some principal members of the city, notwithstanding which suspicions, the manner of the burning all along in a train, and so blown forwards in all its way by strong winds, makes us conclude the whole was an effect of an unhappy chance, or, to speak better, the heavy hand of God upon us for our sins, showing us the tenor of his judgment in thus raising the fire, and immediately after, his miraculous and never enough to be acknowledged mercy in putting a stop to it when we were in the last despair, and that all attempts for the quenching it, however industriously purposed, seemed insufficient. His Majesty then sat hourly in council, and ever since hath continued making rounds about the city in all parts of it, where the danger and mischief was greatest, till this morning that he hath sent his grace the Duke of Albemarle, whom he hath called for to assist him in this great occasion, to put his happy and successful hand to the finishing this memorable deliverance. About the tower the reasonable orders given for plucking down houses to secure the magazines of powder were more especially successful, that part being up the wind, notwithstanding which it came almost to the very gates of it, so as, by this early provision, the several stores of war lodged in the tower were entirely saved, and we have further this infinite cause particularly to give God thanks, that the fire did not happen in any of those places where His Majesty's naval stores are kept, so as, though it pleased God to visit us with His own hand, He hath not, by disfurnishing us with the means of carrying on war, subjected us to our enemies. It must be observed that this fire happened in a part of the town where, though the commodities were not very rich, yet they were so bulky that they could not be removed, so that the inhabitants of that part where it first began have sustained very great loss. But by the best inquiry we can make, the other parts of the town where the commodities were of greater value took the alarm so early that they saved most of their goods of value which possibly may have diminished their loss, though some think that if the whole industry of the inhabitants had been applied to the stopping of the fire, and not to the saving of their particular goods, the success might have been much better not only to the public, but to many of them in their own particulars. 
Through this sad accident it is easy to be imagined how many persons were necessitated to remove themselves and goods into the open fields, where they were forced to continue some time, which could not but work compassion in the beholders. But His Majesty's care was most signal on this occasion, who, besides his personal pains, was frequent in consulting all ways for relieving those distressed persons, which produced so good an effect, as well by His Majesty's proclamation and the orders issued to the neighbour justices of the peace to encourage the sending in provisions to the markets, which are publicly known, as by other directions, that when His Majesty, fearing lest other orders might not yet have been sufficient, had commanded the victualler of his navy to send bread into more fields for the relief of the poor, which, for the more speedy supply, he sent in biscuit out of the sea stores, it was found that the markets had been already so well supplied that people being unaccustomed to that kind of bread declined it, and so it was returned in great part to His Majesty's stores again, without any use made of it. End quote. We are told in another account that the fire broke out in a baker's shop in Pudding Lane, in the lower part of the city, near Thames Street, amongst rotten wooden houses. They who are curious in such matters may not be aware that Cripplegate Church was uninjured, and that in the churchyard are still some remains of the old city wall. The church is a strange medley of architecture, and the pews and pulpit, in the stiff taste of the last two centuries, great square boxes, while above them are Gothic windows. Quote, the damage done by the fire is thus computed. Burned and consumed, 12,000 houses within the walls of the city, and above 1,000 more without the walls, but all of them within the freedom and liberty of London, that is, in all 13,000, or, as others say, 13,200 houses. There were also destroyed the Cathedral Church of St. Paul's, which was then being rebuilt, and as to the stonework, almost finished. Also eighty-seven parish churches, and six consecrated chapels, most of the principal and public edifices, as the Great Guild Hall, wherein were nine several courts belonging to the city, the Royal Exchange, the King's Custom House, Justice Hall, where the sessions were kept eight or nine times in the year for the trial of murderers, felons, and other malefactors, the four prisons, four of the principal gates of the city, and fifty halls of companies, most of which were most magnificent structures and palaces. The whole damage sustained by this fire is almost incredible. The damage done is thus estimated, in houses burnt, three million nine hundred thousand pounds in churches and public edifices as follows the eighty-seven parish churches at eight thousand pounds each six hundred and ninety six thousand pounds six chapels at two thousand pounds each twelve thousand pounds the royal exchange at fifty thousand pounds the king's custom house at ten thousand pounds the fifty-two halls of companies at fifteen thousand pounds each seventy eight thousand pounds three of the city gates at three thousand pounds each, nine thousand pounds, the jail of Newgate, fifteen thousand pounds, four stone bridges, six thousand pounds, the sessions house, seven thousand pounds, the guild hall and courts and offices belonging to it, forty thousand pounds, Blackwell Hall, three thousand pounds, Bridewell, five thousand pounds, Poultry Compter, five thousand pounds, Wood Street Compter, three thousand pounds to which add towards building of st paul's cathedral two million pounds the wares household stuffs monies and other movable goods and so on two million pounds the hire of porters carts wagons barges boats for removing wares and household stuff two hundred thousand pounds in printed books one hundred and fifty thousand pounds in wine, tobacco, sugar, and, of which the city was then very full, one million five hundred thousand pounds, for public works enjoined by Act of Parliament, forty-one thousand five hundred pounds, total ten million seven hundred and thirty thousand five hundred pounds. End quote. The following causes were supposed to have contributed to the great destruction of property. Quote, 
the fire began between one and two o'clock after midnight when all were in a dead sleep it broke out on saturday night when many of the most eminent merchants and others were retired into the country and none but servants left to look to their city houses it was in the long vacation being that particular time of the year when many wealthy citizens and tradesmen were wont to be in the country at fairs and getting in of debts and making up a compts with their chapmen the closeness of the building and narrowness of the streets where it began did much facilitate the progress of the fire by hindering of the engines to be brought to play upon the houses on fire the matter of which the houses were timber and those very old the dryness of the preceding season there having been a great drought even to that very day and all the time that the fire continued which had so dried the timber that it was never more apt to take fire the nature of the wares and commodities stowed and vended in those parts were most combustible of any sold in the whole city as oil pitch tar cordage hemp flax rosin wax butter cheese wine brandy sugar an easterly wind which is the driest of all others had blown for several days together before and at that time very strongly the unexpected failing of the water thereabouts at that time for the engine at the north end of london bridge called the thames water tower which supplied all that part of the city with thames water was out of order and in a few hours was itself burnt down so that the water pipes which conveyed the water from thence through the streets were soon empty lastly an unusual negligence at first and confidence of easily quenching it and of its stopping at several places afterwards turned at length into confusion consternation and despair people choosing rather by flight to save their goods than by a vigorous opposition to save their own houses and the whole city to all which reasons must not be passed over the general suspicion that most then had of incendiaries laying combustible stuff in many places having observed diverse distant houses to be on fire together and many were then taken up on suspicion End quote. within four or five years the city was nearly rebuilt in a more uniform and substantial manner than before but if the designs of sir christopher wren had been carried out london would indeed have been a fine city he intended to have laid out one large street from aldgate to temple bar in the middle of which was to have been a large square capable of containing the new church of st paul with a proper distance for the view all round it he further intended to have rebuilt all the parish churches in such a manner as to be seen at the end of every vista of houses and dispersed at such a distance from one another as neither to be too thick or too thin all the houses to be uniform and supported on a piazza like that of covent garden and by the waterside from the bridge london bridge to the temple he had planned a long and broad wharf or quay wherein he designed to have ranged all the halls that belong to the several companies of the city with proper warehouses for merchants between to vary the edifices and to make it at once one of the most beautiful and most useful ranges of buildings in the world but says his encomiast the hurry of rebuilding and the disputes about property prevented this glorious scheme from taking place it would seem that the great fire was not without its use that houses were rebuilt on the old foundations but in a much better and substantial manner than before though not so well as if sir christopher's plan had been followed we are apt to think that the crowding of several families into one house is an innovation of later times it would rather seem to have been the revival of an obsolete practice the fire rooted out and destroyed rookeries and the stringent laws laid down for the rebuilding of the city prevented such abuses for some years but we find queen elizabeth issuing a proclamation at the time of her progress in fifteen seventy two from which the following is an extract Quote, yet where there are a great multitude of people wrought to inhabit in very small rooms whereof the greater part seem very poor eh, such as live of begging or worse means 
and they heaped up together and in a sort smothered with many families of children and servants in one house or small tenement it must needs follow if any plague or popular sickness should by god's permission enter among the multitude that the same would not only spread itself and invade the whole city and confines as a great mortality should ensue to the same where her majesty's personal presence is many times required besides the great confluence of people from all parts of the realm by reason of the ordinary terms for justice there holden but would also be dispersed through all other parts of the realm to the manifest danger of the whole body thereof for the remedy whereof her majesty by good and deliberate advice of her counsel doth straitly command all manner of persons of what quality soever they be to desist and forbear from any new building of any house or tenement within three miles of the gates of the said city of london to serve for habitation or lodging for any person where no former house hath been known to have been in the memory of such as are now living and also to forbear from letting or setting or suffering any more families than one only to be placed or to inhabit from henceforth in any house that heretofore has been inhabited End quote. and the authorities are moreover enjoined to prevent quote, the heaping up of multitudes of families in the same house or the converting of any one house into multitudes of tenements for dwelling or victualling places End quote. they are charged to prevent quote, the increase of many indwellers or as they are commonly called inmates or undersitters contrary to the good ancient laws End quote. before the fire we are told that when old houses were repaired that were of good amplitude they would make two or three tenements of them to increase the rent and these were turned some into alehouses and let out to the poorer sort great houses were also turned sometimes into alleys consisting of diverse houses care was taken for the preventing of drinking houses more commonly cellars many sheds were also set up to serve for small houses which did but harbour poor people there were also made holes under the shops for the poorer sort of artisans such dwellings were not the fruit of municipal arrangements for the housing of the poor but rather the abuses of them when men devise deliberate plans for such ends they are in general liberal it may be said that as the carrying out of such plans does not affect the law-makers but rather those whom laws control that there is not the usual selfish inducement of profit to guide them it would be more true to say that men shrink from putting on paper that at which they are brought by custom to connive the authorities before the fire took place wished to confine london within a given space so that like continental cities its suburbs should be rural districts not that it should stretch forth its arms in the form of brixton camberwell greenwich hackney hampstead hammersmith wandsworth and others but the natural effect of such provision was to crowd as many persons as could be packed within a given area the fire came and cleared a vast space cleared in fact almost the whole surface of what was then the city of london the parishes of st george's bloomsbury st james st martin's were like what our suburban districts now are places where the nobility lived their residences having a background of garden or rather park oxford street being oxford road fields intervening between gray's inn and hampstead houses scattered here and there rookeries could scarcely have been as yet established beyond the precincts of the city so that when the fire came it made a wholesale clearance in these time-honoured colonies how many perished stripe and others do not tell and we only gather from certain enactments curtailing their excess and checking their extent that such purlieus were the citizens had no sooner looked their losses in the face then they began to repair them heavy were the burdens entailed upon the funds of that ancient corporation during many years deep the groans of the worthy seymour as he pondered on or recapitulated the expense 
but men must live so that very soon a new city stood in the place of the old one not certainly a very picturesque or convenient monument of good taste not a very creditable monument to the liberality of the nation but a fairer representative than its predecessor of the liberality of the londoners and considering the infamous excesses of the court and the disgusting character of charles the second a decent substitute for old london in this good work rookeries had no place the poor were provided for as hewers of wood and drawers of water must ever be but there were no special injunctions that eight or ten families should live in a single house nor did alleys seem to enjoy a blissful immunity from the comforts accessible to dwellers in larger thoroughfares among the directions given for rebuilding the city are provisions for removing abuses the streets to be rebuilt were to be free from certain annoyances which their predecessors could not shake off they were to be raised in the neighbourhood of the thames to a certain level because previous to the fire these streets were periodically inundated sewers were to be formed and drainage carried out after the best model and on the most scientific plans then known that in future the city might be spared the wasting plague so frequent in former times that part of the city which was situated near the thames suffered much from inundation previous to the great fire and the ascent was also difficult it was therefore ordered after the fire that all the ground between thames street and the river should be raised and made higher by three feet at the least above the surface of the ground such old streets and passages within the city of london and its liberty as were narrow and incommodious for carriages and passengers and prejudicial to the trade and health of the inhabitants were to be enlarged new streets wharves and markets were quickly formed brick was henceforth to be used instead of wood we can have little idea of what london was before the fire footnote whilst these sheets were going through the press the writer was gratified by the appearance of a large print of london before the fire by bogue and son of fleet street End footnote. doubtless a strange medley palaces and hovels glorious specimens of the tudor style flanked by timber huts inigo jones's masterpieces concealed by the penthouses of crumbling shops the conduit in cheapside a splendid relic of the past despoiled indeed in edward the sixth's time and shorn of its glory yet contrasting oddly with the mean buildings which surrounded it gresham's exchange in the quaint style perhaps of that still remaining at antwerp old st paul's mutilated by the bad taste of the age with the stone pulpit where hooker preached smithfield still retaining the memory of bloody mary and martyrs fires the goodly hospitals piety's tributes in the olden time the city halls speaking of the guilds and brotherhoods with the privileges which municipalities wrought out with their own good swords churches where convents lavished their wealth the noble's palace and the trader's mansion streets which tell better than the most laboured annals the history of different ages gates which had fortified the city's rebellion thoroughfares which had rung to the cry of clubs and prentices hospitals for diseases now forgotten courts of justice and cellars of merchandise bridges and conduits inns and prisons squares which of old had witnessed brave feats of arms where tournaments once kept up the spirit of a martial age the scenes where fountains ran with wine on festal days and pageants arrayed their tasteful flattery for the new crown sovereign all alike have perished the wasting fire hath invaded halls the architect might have sketched as models of his craft stores of records which enriched a nation's history have perished and yet we may not lament the plague whose periodical ravages were wont to be numbered by its tens of thousands victims has fled the land the hovels which beckoned the advancing flames and aided them in their course have ceased to be and if the old city hath raised in their stead structures which taste condemns 
they wait perhaps for the wand of some better age to bid them vanish and if streets still narrow check the traffic and stop hurrying concourse the citizens have still repaired not a few of their forefathers errors footnote gates which fortified the city's rebellion Quote, gates in the wall of this city says the analyst in old time were four to wit aldgate for the east aldersgate for north ludgate for the west and bridgegate over the river thames for the south but of later times for the ease of citizens and passengers diverse other gates and posterns have been made in the reign of henry the second seth fitzstephen there were seven double gates in the wall of this city but he nameth them not it may therefore be supposed he meant for the first the gate next the tower of london which then served as a postern and now so commonly called for passengers out of the east from thence through tower street eastcheap and candlewick street to london stone the middle point of the highway then through budge row watling street and leaving st paul's church on the right hand to ludgate on the west the next to be aldgate bishopgate crepplegate aldersgate ludgate and the seventh the bridgegate over the thames the posterns of these gates were frequently fitted up and used as prisons with the exception of st john's gate clerkenwell and temple bar about the year seventeen sixty having been found very inconvenient and blocking up the causeway End footnote. for many a year were city feasts despoiled by the expenses the fire entailed and imposts still exist which owe their origin to this great calamity yet we as sons reap the benefit of our father's tears the flames swept away pests which years of litigation might still have spared which selfishness would have clung to and avarice groaned over smithfield not as now the last fortress of relaxing covetousness would have been the type of kindred shambles st giles already yielding to the pressure of awakened common sense would have been kept in countenance by wood-built rockeries and cholera seizing on unnumbered outposts would have outdone the plague we cannot write now of the monument as pope did where london's column pointing to the skies like a tall bully lifts its head and lies returning charity has erased the scandal but it is yet a record of our father's loss and our gratitude they suffered that we might be spared old london is no more but in its stead a vigorous offspring the past has long blotted out the traces of the fire the present retains the blessing it bequeathed end of section twenty nine end of the rookeries of london by thomas beams